I like what I feel in church this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I like what I feel. Praise the Lord. Amen. Going to the book of Hebrews today. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody here. So good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. We have a few guests. We're grateful for them. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. I, I want revival all the time. I want crazy church every service. Amen. And the Lord does too. Amen. He, he, if he wants to speak and he wants to move, Brother Pete, he calm us down. I've seen it happen all my life. Amen. Hallelujah. I got the Holy Ghost. You got the Holy Ghost, you can't help but act a little crazy sometimes. If it's been a while since you lost yourself and lost your mind because you're full of the Spirit, you need to probably pray through again. Probably need to get full of it again so that you can begin to worship the Lord like you want to, like you need to, and what demonstrates, what demonstrates what to the everybody around what he means to you. I better wait till we get the offering took up this morning. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number 12 and verse number 13. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed but let it rather be healed but let it rather be healed i want to speak to you today on that subject let it be healed the purpose of the letter to the hebrews is to encourage the readers to stay true to the gospel to stay true to the lifestyle the way of the lord rather than to allow some circumstance in their life to cause them to turn around and go back to the old way. Human nature, the Bible, your own lives tell us that there's a natural inclination to turn around and go back anytime you face opposition on a new path. Hands that hang down and feeble knees refer to weakness. Because of some, some temporary weakness, and I want you to hear this part well, which might well be the chastening hand of God, they are contemplating turning back. Everything you're going through ain't the devil. Everything you're going through ain't the flesh. Sometimes the Lord has to put roadblocks in your way or wake up calls in your life for you to recognize and realize you've got off track a little bit. Straight paths would be the opposite of crooked or difficult paths, which to continue walking on in their present state would result in the inevitable turning away. But as is the will of God and the purpose of this letter, he said, let it, let the weakness, let the infirmity, let the, the roadblock be healed rather than to cause them to lose out. In verses 1 through 4, we're given a formula for encouragement and success. He said, lay aside every weight or hindrance that's slowing you down. And also get rid of the sin. That's generally speaking sin. Just sin in life that is so readily available. How many of you know we don't have to hunt for an opportunity to sin? It'll find you. Sit still long enough, it'll find you. And after you've done this, lay aside the weights and get rid of the sin. Run with confidence the race that is set before us, which denotes that we have an assured destination rather than the circuitous route that the flesh would lead us in looking for fulfillment. The flesh will lead you in so many different directions seeking for, for fulfillment for your life, but following the will and the plan of God will lead you in a direct direction a precise direction that will find you with perfect fulfillment under the hand of Almighty God. Looking unto Jesus, verse 2 says, the author, the beginner, the founder, the word made flesh and finisher, the perfecter, the perfecter who says, Brother David, I have overcome the world. He completed it. He started it. He completed it. And the journey has been laid out before us of our faith. 
who for the joy that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him, which was the redemption of all mankind, the ability, the power, the sacrifice that would destroy sin and death for all men. That was the joy that was set before him. And it caused him to endure the cross. Everybody say endure. Don't you think for one minute we glorify the agony so much by, by things we celebrated Easter and, and people to some people it's just become a, a thing that hangs on the wall with, with a, a figure on it. Uh, but I got to let you know, he did not, even though the joy that was set before him kept him going, he did not enjoy what he had to go through. Endured the cross. The Bible says despising the shame. The vision that was before him did not obliterate the, the present suffering. The vision just kept him going. When the flesh feels like quitting, your vision will keep you going. It says consider him. That word consider is only found in this place in the New Testament from the original Greek. And it conveys the idea of comparison as well as considering. So we are not to only consider and view the sufferings of Jesus Christ, but we are in fact to compare them to whatever we're going through. Boy, that sheds new light on what you might be battling with, doesn't it? That sheds, sheds new light on whatever you might be struggling with. He endured, the Bible says, such contradiction of sinners. I thought along about that yesterday and even this morning. That he endured such contradiction of sinners. Which he received under the influence of sinful man. Totally the opposite of what he should receive. The greatest contradiction as it were. The considering of Jesus is necessary. The considering of Calvary's cross is necessary to put your struggle into a proper perspective. Unless you want to be weary and faint in your minds, unless you want to turn around and go back, you have got to put your struggles in proper perspective. Because verse 4 reminds us that we haven't yet resisted or fought or withstood unto blood. Now think about this. We have not yet struggled. We have not yet fought. We have not yet battled until it cost us our own blood. Striving against sin. I thought about this, man, and I... I uh, Brother McKinney, what happens if we're not careful? Instead of fighting against sin, we try to find a way to embrace it. We try to find a way to justify it. Whether it be casting aspersions upon those that blaze the trail for us or deciding that it's just not that necessary. But the Bible says he resisted. He fought against sin with the shedding of his blood. He gave his life to destroy sin. How can we embrace it? How can we use it as a crutch? We're all sinners. We're all saved by grace. And I do agree with that to some extent. But how can we, Brother Rice, ever embrace sin as, as something that's just going to be a part of us when Jesus... God have mercy. When Jesus Christ died on Mount Calvary, so we don't have to be shackled by it anymore. How dare we embrace something that he died to give us freedom from, that he died to destroy their power. You don't have to embrace sin. You don't have to accept sin. It's not got to be a part of your life for the rest of your life, but you've been set free by the power of the cross. God forbid that we, we embrace it and, and accept it and just say, well, I just got to make it through life and low down no good for nothing sinner. Then what was Calvary for? I'm going to preach this morning and I don't care who it hair lips. We're going to have a move of God. We're talking to some people in the book of Hebrews, Brother Rice. They were contemplating giving up. 
They were thinking, God have mercy, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. They were thinking that whatever little mess they were having to go through right now just wasn't worth it no more. And he was simply reminding them of the man Christ Jesus who came to earth for them, who lived for them, and then who died for them, who was rejected and shamed and spat upon and beat upon and slapped, crammed thorns and making fun and ridiculing. The only crown the world ever gave him was a crown of thorns. Put your struggle in proper perspective. I'm not belittling or demeaning anybody's problems, but I'm telling you, it might be time to let it be healed. The struggle was against sin. Sin is the separator. From the beginning, with the sin of Adam and Eve, sin forever separated man from God. It destroyed that treasured relationship that he desired with his prized creation. Jesus knew no sin, yet the Bible says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to defeat sin for us that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Verses 5 through 11 remind us that all trials aren't a result of the enemy trying to destroy us, but they indeed can be the chastening of the Lord. And we are instructed, hear me well this morning, we are instructed to not despise it, but rather to embrace it as the correction of a loving father. It is not a joyous occasion, this chastening of the Lord, to be celebrated, but it indeed is grievous. And it should be. But afterwards, it brings us to the place where we're being set forth, where we're bringing forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's the chastening. Hear me right now. There's another time for me to teach on this same thing, and we're going to have to do it. The chastening of growth. There will come a time. There's no set time. For my boys, it was 14 and 11. I remember it distinctly. I remember it well. For Carly... It ain't happened yet. But there will come a time, Brother Billy, when you spank your child for the last time. There will come a time when you will ground them for the last time. In case you didn't know, I believe in spanking and grounding. And if you don't, you need to read your Bible. The discipline of youth is only there to promote the good citizenship of adulthood. It has a purpose. It's not because they're getting on your nerves. <laughs> the same thing applies spiritually. Notice it says, later on in Scripture, to them which are exercised thereby. And it refers to long-term training rather than sporadically working out. And it's to promote a lifestyle of righteousness, basically bringing to life the lessons learned. If you think that the Lord's got big plans for you and he sees you headed in the wrong direction and he's not going to try to stop you, you've lost your mind. He's got a life invested in us, ladies and gentlemen. He's got a death invested in us, and he's got a resurrection invested in us, and he's going to do whatever he can to stop you from going down the wrong path. Verse number 12. Wherefore, wherefore, Recognizing these principles. Wherefore, since you understand and recognize that the Lord, Brother David, until he gets, when he's, till he says it's done, he, everything that he does is for us to make it. Verse 
Everything he does is for us to succeed and be successful both in this life and the life to come. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Hands that hang down are referring to limp, ineffective, and weak hands. Feeble knees is referring to weak knees and incapable of standing and lacking the stamina to complete the journey. We are so quick, just as the Hebrews have done, to give so much credibility to our difficulty that we use it as an excuse for doing nothing. He says, lift up. Lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. You've got to understand that we're not talking necessarily about, about a physical lifting of the hands, but to be strengthened in the knowledge that God is doing a work in you and He's doing it for your good, not for your bad. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't let you down. He hasn't walked away. He hasn't broken His promise. You have just got off on the wrong track. And instead of misery com loves company, we need to get a mentality that says the Lord is trying to do something in my life. When you mess up, when you sin, when you walk away and all hell breaks loose in your life, it ain't just as a result of your bad decisions. Sometimes it's the Lord letting something happen in your life to make you turn around and go another way. Spiritual weakness is often a matter of perspective anyway. Can I get an amen? It's a matter of perspective. Remember Paul, this was one of our trivia questions the other night, which was wonderful, by the way. If you didn't come, shame on you. It was, it was, a, it was an incredible amount of fun. And I got some medals to prove it. Winning's funner than losing, by the way. Amen. Remember, Apostle Paul, spiritual weakness is a matter of perspective. If you receive this word that I'm bringing to you this morning, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Spiritual weakness is a matter of perspective, Brother Pete. Here's what I got to pray for. Here's what I got to pray for, because I see it happening. I got to pray for the courage to stand up and look you in the eye and tell you your problem ain't because the whole world hates you. Your problem is because you got off track. Huh? Your problem is because you're letting sin rule in your life. You're letting the carnal mind rule in your life. And then when everything breaks loose in it, you got to find somebody to blame. And the devil's just convenient, or the flesh is just convenient, or your neighbor, the one that called you an ugly name, or the one that looked ugly at you at the Walmart checkout line. The one that cut you off, stole your parking place. Beat you to the clearance rack and got your size blouse or whatever. You laugh, but it's sometimes just that silly when you're on the outside looking in. You wonder what in the world's going through your mind for goodness sake. Can't you see that these continual bad decisions have resulted in the Lord having to open up a bag of switches? I don't know if you're feeling me very good this morning, but you better be. Because the Lord's going to get his way. He's going to have a church. And it's going to be a purified church. It's going to be a holy church. It's going to be a church he can be a proud of, be proud of. Where God is not ashamed to be called their God. You think about it just for a minute. One of the biggest reasons we get mad at our kids is because their bad behavior makes us embarrassed. If 
you don't believe me, let me tell you, I got more whoopings at church than I did anywhere. The second most place I got whoopings was when we had company over at the house. Because my daddy frowned incredibly on being bad in church. If I was coming up in this day and age, I wouldn't come up. It would have been all over but the crime. I wouldn't have had to worry about no pretty chairs to sit in because I couldn't. Let me tell you something. You couldn't be bad enough for my daddy to say, I give up. He'd whoop you six days a week and twice on Sunday till you came around to his way of thinking. Help me out here, brother. Amen. All right. You say, oh, he was abuser. No, he wasn't. And if he could come back right here, I'd let him whoop my behind today. <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. There's a right way. And it's his way. And the book said there's a way that seems, God have mercy. God have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost. This message must just be for me, Brother Pete, because I feel like I'm about to go crazy. But there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, Brother Manning, and the book says the end thereof are the ways of death. If, you're a, if your way ain't working, for goodness sake, get on your knees before God, repent of what you've been doing, and say, Lord, lead me in the right path. If it ain't working, stop. Do something different. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Sister Maria, he wants what's best for us. He ain't got no desire to hurt you. It's a matter of perspective. The Bible says Paul declared, I sought the Lord thrice. I sought him. That means there was some prayer meetings devoted entirely to getting rid of this problem I got. That's what Paul said. I got a thorn in the flesh. There are many things. I've read that he was hunchbacked, ugly, little old measly, weasley looking man. Had some kind of funky eye disease, Brother David, where his eyes ran and matted and stuff all the time. It was visible to look at. Because remember he told that one group, if it had been possible, you'd have plucked your own eyes out and gave them to me. The Bible doesn't really say what the thorn in the flesh was, but Brother Rice, it hurt him. It caused him problems. It was a struggle for him to keep doing what he was doing and battling. He said, I sought the Lord thrice. You got to understand something. Paul, Brother Robbie Paul seeking the Lord was a long way from, oh, before I get up, Lord, think you could hook a brother up with some good eyes? But you read, even when he, when he searched after the gospel, when he searched after the truth, he spent three years. Paul didn't just waste a few minutes, you know. But when Paul sought the Lord, he fasted and he prayed and he isolated himself from everybody. And the Bible said the Lord gave him an answer. And it said, my grace is good enough. Without you being healed, without you being delivered, without you being vindicated, my grace is sufficient for you. And all of a sudden, Paul's perspective changed. And he said, I learned, therefore, that when I am weak, then am I strong. And that his strength is made perfect or shown complete in my weakness. Perfect example. When you're going through hell on earth, you'll pray and you'll fast and you'll cry and you'll whine to everybody that'll listen. Am I the only one's ever been there before? Oh, I've been there. Sure I have. But as soon as the Lord brings you out of it and you get back up on the mountain, you ain't got time to fast. You ain't got time to pray. You ain't got time to read your Bible because the Lord's gave you so many blessings. 
Paul said, I realize the Lord let me keep my thorn in the flesh because I'm smart, I'm anointed, I'm charismatic, and people follow me. And if the Lord didn't keep me something in my flesh to keep me humble, I would be exalted too high. And I would forget what the Lord had done for me. Hebrews 13, 12 and 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So it makes straight paths for your feet. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? Make straight paths for your feet. Now, Brother Billy, the opposite of that would be crooked paths. Right? Straight, the Bible tells us, the straight way is not the popular way. The straight way is not the easy way. The straight way is not the way that you just wake up one morning and you walk out of your house and the angels go, mm, and the light shines down on it and it's just the yellow brick road leading out from your front porch. But the straight way is not the popular way. The straight way is the difficult way. The straight way is the way the flesh doesn't like. I know Brother Billy, Brother Pete, many of the rest of you have. How many of you have ever traveled much over in the hill country? Driving around Thayer, Ellington. How many of you have ever driven around over in that way? What's the common thing about all those roads? They're what? About like them roads we took going to men's conference. They're, they're crooked. Why, why are they crooked? Why are they crooked? You know why they're crooked? It's because most of them were old logging roads. And in order to get the logs out, they had to find the way, the path of least resistance. Lord Jesus. So it's a meandering. We've seen it before. Seemed like you drive 53 miles to get six. And, and we see it and think, boy, that would have been a lot better way to go right through there. But you see, Brother Ray, the problem in making a straight path is it takes more work and it takes more effort. The truth of the matter is, once you've gone through the effort, it's a better way. My Lord. It's a better way. But Brother David, we're in a hurry. We got places to go and we got appointments to keep and, and we've got to, you know, I'll come back and I'll blaze through that later. You go up Interstate 55, start getting towards St. Louis. You think those big holes in them mountains just, you know, they went up there a couple of days, set about four dynamite sticks, kabloom, 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 and there's a pretty straight road went through there. No, it was years of development, years of hard work and effort to make a good straight path. And the Bible says we got to get on the straight path. It's human nature to follow the path of least resistance. But it's holy nature to stay on the straight path. The straight road isn't an easy road to build, but it's an easier road to travel. Straight refers to an unswerving commitment to follow Jesus. If you fail to take the steps necessary... To get yourself back on the straight path. It won't be long until your infirmity causes you to turn around completely. And you'll be completely out of the way. But the desire is rather that you be healed. But rather that you be healed. What does healing mean to you? What does healing mean to the man laid at the lame at the gate beautiful? It, it wasn't a matter of making him feel better, Brother Pete. It wasn't a matter of making it so he could, the th things would be more, Lord Jesus have mercy. That things would be more accessible to him. It wasn't a matter about changing the world to fit him. But the Bible says,